by a range of news outlets here. We live just a few miles away from the media capital of the, of the world, New York City, uh, but uh, the communities of Uniondale, Hempstead, uh, all the surrounding areas around Hofstra get very limited coverage, and when that coverage does occur, it's generally focused on one issue, crime. Uh, and so we've been working on this project, and we brought community uh, organizers, activists in, uh, to, to participate, and Carla was one of them. And I'm really happy because not only did she work with us on this project, but she's also, as a result of that, has, uh, is, is now a member, uh, is working on the training program at WRHU Radio, our community licensed radio station here at the Herbert School. And hopefully within a few weeks after she finishes the program, the training program, she'll be a community volunteer at the radio station doing programming about these issues on a regular basis on WRHU. So that's a great, just wanted to d give that little plug and appreciate your time for doing that because I think that's really, that's part of what we were trying to do with the News Deserts Project. So I'm going to shut up, throw it to you. Let's welcome Carla Alas and uh, we'll start the conversation. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Are we up? We have breakfast? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, it's truly a pleasure to be here, and thank you to Mario and Hofstra University for having us today and to give us the space to discuss this very important issue that is uh, essential workers and wage theft on Long Island, like my, my colleague Mario said. Um, this is a prevalent issue that is usually under covers. Um, it's not oftentimes that it's spoken about, but that nonetheless, it doesn't mean that it is not happening, and it doesn't mean that it doesn't that it's not affecting real people. Um, many of these workers are immigrants, many of them are undocumented, and many of them are often struggling for survival and fighting for survival uh, in our communities. So, let's begin. Um, a lot of this initiative is started because of. Uh, the Hofstra University research and investigation. So why don't we get a sketch on the timeline on how this project came to be and how these investigations came out to light. Okay, so um, I, I, yeah, I'm gonna give a thumbnail sketch again. Uh, Scott Printon, some of you may know, I know a number of you know Scott Printon, he's a professor of journalism, assistant professor of journalism at the Herbert School of Communication. Uh, and he's a wonderful um, investigative reporter and community-based reporter that does a lot of uh, uh, coverage uh, of the community. He's worked for years in, in the uh, Long Island Herald. He can't. He couldn't make it today, so I really wanted to kind of share how, before we talk about the issue of essential workers, how uh, not only wage theft but how other issues around labor, uh, the, the violation of labor rights, have impacted uh, particularly immigrant workers here on Long Island. Um, and I just wanted to kind of give a plug, a, a personal plug for the a project that we're working on at the Herbert School, which is really a community-based media site. It's called the Long Island Advocate. Just a quick sense, aside from those who work for the Advocate, I see a few of the journalists who work with, how many of you have heard of the Long Island Advocate? All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it out there and I'm, because I, I, I'm not ashamed to try to plug it because we're trying not to make this be perceived simply as, oh, a little student project that where students are going to practice journalism. Now, this is really a community-based media outlet that we're trying to cover the community and fill those vacuums that exist in the community uh, that we that I indicated before with the uh, with the uh, News Deserts project. Um, so, the Advocate has been covering these issues around worker rights uh, since its inception, about two a little more than two years ago. Nadia might be able to correct me when the first campaign around the excluded workers started, uh, uh, it was about, it was, it was during the pandemic and when there was yep. a whole push to say what kind of protections can we provide for immigrant workers who are the essential workers but unlike those others who were getting paycheck protections and other uh, support during the pandemic, uh, because primarily non, undocumented workers w had no, you know, place to land, uh, there was no way to support what they were doing. Uh, so there was an ongoing campaign to draw attention to what we needed to do to support the essential workers who weren't getting covered by some of these protections. Uh, and there was, I know Endelon was involved with it, I know, uh, I think Nadia, you, were, you, you, were, you organized an event in which uh, our reporter at the time, Damali Ramirez, who graduated in May, great journalist, she's now working in Washington doing some really in incredible work. She was one of the first, I think she, if, she even told me that she was the, I think she was the only journalist who went to that event. 
Uh, she was. She and was, and, she and so she covered is. this report that later, this event, and that later as weeks went on and as this campaign picked up steam, now started getting coverage in the Times and Newsday and other, other media outlets. So the Long Island Advocate has always been trying to cover these events that for the most part, and these issues that for the most part are being uh, un uncovered or not reported on by uh, so-called mainstream journalism. We also opened the Long Island Advocate to the community. I mean, Nadia has written, I, 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 we've been pushing Nadia to write more and, and got Essen to write more commentaries, analysis about these issues. Uh, so it's not only journalists, student journalists, but we're also asking community uh, uh, participants to, to engage. We've had P Patrick Young, others who have written for the Advocate about some of these issues in, uh, uh, impacting immigrant workers on Long Island. Um, and then the, 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 the most recent wave of stories that is uh, connected to some of the things we're going to talk about today, which is wage theft, last, I guess it was in the summer, again, Endelon with the Workplace Project uh, were trying to call attention to another campaign, the Dale campaign, which is Deferred Action for Labor Enforcement, Enforcement mm -hmm. right? Uh, the Dale campaign, which was basically trying to say so many immigrant workers are getting their rights violated uh, and 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 with impunity, and precisely because many many of them feel that they're vulnerable and they can't speak out, and there's no protections, and deportation threats are constantly there, and so the Dali campaign, and I know uh, our, our other panelists are going to talk more about it, th they they were trying to draw attention and say why we need to create some protections so that they do speak out, and so um, Scott Britton, our professor, covered the campaign launch here on Long Island, and at that event. Met some of the people that we just walked that just walked in workers who were who were uh, victims of wage theft on Long Island, um, and essentially I'm not gonna again I don't want to spend too much time on this um, Miguel and if if uh, we can have uh, Saul and, and Miguel come on to the table that'd be great. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. You can go to the Long Island Advocate. There's a series of stories that have been covered, but essentially Scott began investigating the story after attending that Dale campaign event um, that uh, Nad Nadia was, was a part of and, and the Workplace Project was a part of. And he met some of the workers from Nick's Pizza, who again, who just arrived, so I'm it was perfect timing that they came just now. Uh, Scott uh, met with them, talked to them about how these workers were, were basically ripped off of four, up to $400,000 worth of back wages uh, for, for a long period of time. He started uh, looking through the court documents around the case. Uh, um, uh, he obtained dozens of, of, of documents uh, from the New York State Unified Court System. He interviewed the workers, Saul in particular, and some of the other workers. Long Island Advocate published the story, continued searching. They found 12 lawsuits, four of them involving uh, Angelus and his partners. Uh, uh, who Angelus was one of the owners of Nick's Pizza, Nicholas Angelus of Rockville Center. Um, uh, 12 lawsuits, four of them involving Angelus. The common denominator was another guy named Peter Pulakas, who has paid out already about $1.9 million in settlements to date, uh, and then and, and basically uncovered a whole slew of, of violations that were carried out and that, and that these workers were never paid back. Scott Britton reached out to the Department of Labor, trying to find out, wait, if these cases were settled, years ago, why haven't they been paid? Why haven't they been uh, uh, you know, reimbursed? And the DOL continues to kind of back, back um, pedal and, and foot drag on the, on the requests from, from uh, Scott, as well as our colleague from WABC TV, which has its new Long Island Bureau right here at the Herbert School. Um, uh, they were both r reporting and covering on this story. Um, just to quickly summarize it, the Nick's Pizza workers were cheated out of a little more than $400,000 by Angelus from 2003 through 2011. Angelus still owes more than $300,000 in state penalties. The workers filed their complaint with the State Department of Labor in 2009, and then they heard nothing until the spring of 2022, 13 years. Scott took up the case in the summer. WABC's Kristen Thorne also joined the investigation in September, so they've been kind of following. Really, it's been Scott's work, but WABC TV has been really good in getting it out there to another audience. Uh, and right now, they're awaiting word for another 1,600 pages of documents from the Department of Labor, again, who've been foot dragging for months now to get these documents to us, to, to Scott, uh, after they filed a couple of Freedom of Information requests, FOIA requests, uh, last September and one in October. And apparently now we have some state representatives, uh, assemblymen, 
uh, Ramos and some others who are pushing the Department of Labor to get the, those documents to see what is it? Why can't they pay back? What you know? What's why won't they pay back the um, the workers? Right after already having this settled in court and recognizing that yes, indeed, these back wages were 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 owed. I urge you to look at the Long Island Advocate, look at the different stories. Uh, Fatima is uh, one of our students, graduate students in journalism, who's covered this story closely as well, going to the protests. I wanted to share with, the, with you the images, but uh, for technical reasons, it's too complicated right now, but some of the images of the, of the protests that were held before in front of Nick's uh, Pizza in Rockville Center a couple of months ago. And we're constantly staying on this story and hoping that you'll also stay on the story as, as the folks here uh, do the uh, organizing, mobilizing, uh, and, and rabble-rousing to make sure that justice is given, is provided to these workers, right? Because uh, too often um, they, 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 they are ignored, they're invisible in the, in the mainstream media, uh, and, but it happens every day. And so this is, these are the issues that I, I suppose we're really going to focus on broad, more broadly with, with the panelists. So from here, I, I, could, I can shut up because I really wanted to listen to what you guys are saying, what you guys have to say. Thank you, Professor Murillo. And now that everybody is here, we will take some time to actually introduce the panelists. I realized I didn't do that. So <laughs> um, you all know Professor Murillo. Th uh, Professor Murillo. Uh, everybody can have uh, to about a two to three minutes to introduce themselves. So we can just go around the table and we can follow up with Jessica Greenberg. Sure, my name is Jessica Greenberg. I'm the managing attorney at Carayson. And then, Saul. Uh, good morning. My name is Saul Asensio. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to be um, interpreting for Saul, so I, obviously that I don't have to interpret. Um, but uh, Nadia Marin Molina, I'm here on behalf of Endilon, which is the National Day Labor Organizing Network. Miguel Alasevillano, uh, Workplace Project. Thank you all very much for that introduction. And um, as Professor Murillo gave us some context on the investigator that has been going on, uh, I think now it's only proper to hear a little bit more about the story about from Saul and some of his coworkers that, as Professor Murillo mentioned, have been stolen out of over four hundred thousand dollars in back wages over the and plus interest over the past fourteen years or so. So, Saul, si nos puede contar un poco de su historia. Uh, bueno, uh, la historia de nosotros es, uh, somos siete personas, trabajamos por un patrón, trabajamos, yo trabajé 16 años con él. So my, my, our story um, is that there are seven of us and we work for an employer. Um, I worked for him for 16 years. Eh, tengo mis compañeros, Julio. Eh, Osvaldo, los demás, bueno, no pudieron venir porque están trabajando. I have my uh, co-workers here, Julio and Osvaldo, um, and the rest weren't able to come because they're working. Eh, la historia de nosotros, bueno, <laughs> es muy, muy dura porque y nos dimos cuenta de la demanda hasta ahorita en el 2021. Y la demanda fue ganada en el 2011. Um, our, our story is very difficult because we found out um, the, what happened most recently um, the, about the lawsuit in 2021 and that the, we had won this in 2011. Y la historia, bueno, es lo más bonito que que solo fue una persona que le notificaron, le llegaron los papeles a él de que la demanda había sido ganada en el 2011. Y entonces, y vino el departamento de labores, no lo notificó a nadie, 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 no que hasta el compañero lo notificó hasta el 2011, lo notificaron la carta, y él vino y se comunicó con nosotros y me dijo, Saúl, ganamos la demanda. Um, and so the interesting thing was that when uh, our coworker received the notice, he was the only one out of all of us who, who received a notification um, from the Department of Labor. 
Um, and then he contacted the rest of us. He contacted me, and he said, Saul, we won the, the lawsuit, our complaint. Y entonces me comuniqué con las demás personas, eh, mis compañeros, y les dije, eh, me llamó Osvaldo, que la demanda la ganamos, y, y empezamos. Entonces me dice yo, ¿cómo así? Porque nosotros pensamos porque ya la habíamos perdido. We, we, I contacted the rest of uh, my coworkers and we, we talked about it, that we supposedly already won, but we, I had thought that this had been lost. Y llamamos al departamento de labores y llamé y me dijo la, la que me contestó al servicio cliente, me dijo, sí, me dijo, su demanda fue ganada en el 2011, me dijo. Y le digo, ¿por qué hasta ahora notifican? Le digo yo. Y no sé, me dijo, eso no, esas preguntas no se las puedo contestar yo. Entonces me, le digo yo, pero están supuestos a mandarlos una carta o algo a nuestras casa o lo que sea, sí, me dijo, pero eso, y me dijo, ahora el departamento, el, eh, la, la demanda la tiene Nasu Country, me dijo. Oh, okay. um, so I, I spoke to the Department of Labor um, to find out what, what had happened, and they said, yeah, you, you did win it, um, and, you know, he said, well, shouldn't we have been notified, shouldn't we have found out a long time ago, and they said, well, we can't talk to you about that. Um, but uh, now the, it's in the hands of Nassau County. Y bueno, entonces uh, me dijo ella, ustedes tienen que ir a, a Mineola, a la corte de ahí, que ahí está todo ya, eh, ya Alba, Albany. Mm -hmm. Ya no tiene nada que ver aquí, me dijo, y ya, entonces ustedes ya pertenecen a Nassau Country. Fuimos a Nassau Country, yo fui, y con los papeles que él me envió y me dijo, de entré, pasé, di mi ID, de entré, entonces me dijo la, la muchacha arriba, al segundo piso para ahí que fui, me dijo, aquí no hay ningún papel de eso, me dijo, no sé por qué tú andas los papeles, me dijo. Y le dije, perdón, y le dije yo, no porque yo tengo estos papeles, no, me dijo, esos papeles tiene que venir un abogado y presentarlos, ok. Um, so I went to a place in Nassau County. I went with the, the court papers that, um, that we had gotten and um, brought it to them in the office. And the person who was there, she said, well, I don't know why you have these. Um, you know, there's nothing that I can do with them. Um, you need to, you know, a, a lawyer should be presenting these. Y bueno, fuimos entonces, fui a la corte de ahí, me dijo mi compañero, eh, mira, me dijo, vamos a poner esto en el cherry, me dijo, ok. Y pusimos ese caso en el cherry, el cherry, bueno, eh, no lo resolvió nada, nos dijo el cherry que teníamos que llevar los números de cuenta de, del patrón, eh, el patrón y tenía casa, y tenía que lo que tuviera el patrón nosotros llevarle toda la información y nosotros no podemos actuar en eso es ellos yeah and so um, they they said that we needed to take this to the sheriff so we went to the sheriff uh, to to the Nassau County Sheriff's office and they said that we need we needed to get them um, information like we needed to get them the uh, employer's bank account number we needed to get them information about the homes Um, that this person had, and we said, how are we supposed to get that? We don't have access to any of that information. Bueno, entonces de ahí re regresamos, nos reunimos, fuimos al departamento de labores eh, Clinton, Mineola, a Garden City, y casi todos nos cerraron la puerta. And so we came back, we tried the Department of Labor at Clinton, 50 Clinton, Um, Mineola, Garden City, and pretty much they all closed their doors. Y de ahí, bueno, eh, dije yo, bueno, vamos a ir a, a, a ellos a buscarlo, a, a que nos ayuden ellos, fuimos de la licenciada, el licenciado, los que están presentes, y ellos empezaron a ayudarnos. Y, y hemos llegado hasta este caso gracias a ellos. Um, and so then that's when we decided we were going to go to the, to the organization, he points to us, but it's to, to the organization, to the workplace project. Um, and then that's when they started to help. Porque aquí 
uh, sinceramente casi todos nos cerraron las puertas eh, porque hemos buscado ¿entiendes? yo busqué un, buscamos un abogado y el abogado me dijo mira, este caso está ganado porque le presentamos los papeles y me dijo aquí este caso está ganado, me dijo, aquí es como que yo te voy a quitar fue sincero, te voy a quitar el dinero yo me dijo y sin hacer nada me dijo porque aquí la corte decidió me dijo que ustedes tienen el caso ganado me dijo, aquí solo necesitan que presionen y eso estamos haciendo y pidiendo ayuda Um, the other thing is that we had already tried. We went to a lawyer um, with the information, and the lawyer told us, he said, y you know, he was honest at least. He said, um, I could take this case, but I'm just going to end up taking your money because this case, you've already won the case. I don't, I don't really have to do anything. Um, I would just charge you for my work, but I wouldn't really do anything. I would just take part of your money. You've already won the case. You have an order. Um, the only thing you need to do is pressure. And, and that's, what we're, that's what we're doing now. Y entonces estamos a buscar, a ellos nos están ayudando con eso y estamos haciendo presión. Hemos ido a, a manifestaciones, a restaurantes. Pero no sé, el señor creo que... <laughs> No sé, no le da ninguna tentación de, de que pague o, o no sé qué está pasando. Necesitamos más o menos respuesta. Es lo que nosotros necesitamos, la colaboración de, de alguien que nos, que nos apoye. Por. That's, that's what we're doing now. We're, uh, we're pressuring um, because from what we can tell, the employer, um, he isn't responding. He doesn't seem to feel any need to respond. Um, we don't know why, we don't understand it, um, but we know that we need support. Um, we're looking for collaboration, um, and we, we want to keep pressuring him. So, y, perdón, por interrumpir, por interrumpir, solo una preguntita más. ¿Nos puede contar un poco sobre el contexto de cuáles fueron las condiciones mientras usted estaba, estaba trabajando con Saúl? The question would be, can you tell us more about the context of what led you to file the complaint with the DOL and the yeah. context yeah. during, yeah. like, in yeah. the... Um, in this company where you worked? En el trabajo bueno, yo trabajé 16 años con él. Eh, ellos trabajaron conmigo. Bueno, el, trabajamos casi como una familia. La mayoría teníamos 12, 14 años, eh, 10 años. Nadie tenía menos. Uh, trabajamos duro, trabajamos we, 80 horas. We, we had worked for a long time. I worked for him for 16 years, others for 10. 12, 14 years, we had all worked a long time for him uh, t together as, as a family, um, but it was really hard work. I, we worked 80 hours a week. Y el maltrato, pues bueno, era malo porque tuvimos un manager, un italiano malo, eh, trataba mal a la gente, nos trataba mal, bueno, yo sufrí mucho maltrato, mis compañeros también, ¿entiendes? Eh, les decía con todo respeto monkey, les decía malas palabras todo um, we had a we, there, there was mistreatment, there was abuse we had a, an abusive manager um, who was, was always um, mistreating uh, workers, he would call people a monkey um, and he would say uh, I guess curse he would curse at people y y así duramos casi 16 años eh, con ellos, ¿me eh, entiendes? Porque fuimos fiel con él, porque el trabajo, bueno, este, nosotros necesitamos trabajo porque sinceramente casi la mayoría estamos recién venidos cuando estuvimos laborando con ellos. Eh, un hombre puede decir que tiene sus negocios, tiene Nick, Nick Angelines, se llama el dueño, eh, tiene... Ahorita tiene que dar como sus seis negocios, cuatro en Manhattan y dos aquí en Long Island. O sea, es una, es una compañía grande. Si ustedes ven eh, o ponen en Google Nick's Pizza y ustedes van a ver quién es él y quién es representante de Nick's Pizza. Um, and, and we worked for a long time for him because we because we, we were, some of us were newly arrived in the country um, and we needed the work um, and it was stable 
And he's somebody who, he has a lot of money. He has uh, six businesses. He has uh, four in Manhattan, two on Long Island. Um, if you look him up on Google, you'll find out more about uh, him and Nick's Pizza. Y bueno, eh, mis compañeros, pues eh, estuvimos uh, trabajando 80 horas, eh, 82, o sea, entramos de 10 y salíamos a las 11 de la noche, a veces salíamos a las 12, fines de semana y trabajamos. En ese tiempo, eh, yo ganaba, me pagaba él mis 450 dólares, eh, mi compañero ganaban 350, y ellos ganaban, otros ganaban 375. Y siempre me entiende, el negocio era muy, 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 le puedo decir que era bien movido, pues era una pizzería en ese tiempo muy grande. Y nosotros siempre estuvimos con él, con ellos, y, y siempre estuvimos ahí presentes, trabajando 80, 72 horas. Siempre nos tocaba ese, 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 ese trabajo. Y nunca, me entiende, tuvimos unas vacaciones. Nunca tuvimos días de enfermedad, nada. Solamente el día libre que nos tocaba a nosotros. Um, so, uh, we worked with him all of this time. We worked, we were making about $400 or 350 375 depending e each one of us. Um, but we, um, we weren't getting paid uh, extra hours or overtime, we weren't getting any holidays, we weren't getting, we got no vacation, we got no sick days. Um, the only days that we had off were our one day a week um, that we had. We worked on weekends, um, but we did have one day a week off. And we were working 10 to 12 hours a day. Entonces, um, bueno, lo que nosotros necesitamos, o sea, no estamos quitándole el dinero a él, <laughs> es dinero de nosotros. ¿Me entiende? Porque es que nosotros trabajamos y que nosotros sabemos que lo hemos ganado porque nosotros no hemos venido a robarle a él ni nada como lo podemos decir a él si estuviera enfrente o algo. Es dinero que nosotros, que, que nosotros lo ganamos y que sabemos que nosotros lo, lo, lo sudamos y, y, que, y que él sabe que no es un robo que nosotros le estamos haciendo. ¿Me entiende? Si él debe esa cantidad de dinero, porque es una cantidad grande que se le ha acumulado, porque él lo ha querido, o no sé por qué lo está pasando, no sé cómo les digo, no es porque puede haber algo ahí, o qué es lo que no pasa, que él no puede eh, pagarnos. Yeah, and, and I, the thing that I would say is that, um, you know, he, we're not, we're not stealing his money, we're not taking his money. He owes us the money that we worked for. Um, we worked for and earned that money. Um, and if it's accumulated to a large amount, it's because he hasn't paid it. Um, he hasn't paid what he owes. Um, and we're asking for him to pay what he owes. And we still don't understand why it is that he hadn't, hasn't paid it. And I would say that, that exactly that to him if he were seated, seated here in front of us. Thank you. But let's see, but if I can just redirect the question also to some of the organizations, um, Workplace Project and Dillon, how did you guys get involved in this case? And um, this was also like during the pandemic, so what was also the great, like the greater context of, uh, of this case? Well, <coughs> good morning. Uh, and I um, thank Carla and thanks Hofstra uh, to promote the debate for this, uh, for this cause. And, uh, how we get involved. It, as Saul said, he visited us because Workplace Projects is one of the uh, few that is dedicated to the waste theft. Every single day, every single day, we have uh, a visitor. They labor, uh, worker, or anyone residents, citizens, demanding, uh, claiming for uh, support because they have, uh, they are victim of waste, uh, waste theft. That's why they are getting involved. And, uh, but also then why we are involved because also all of these kind of procedures and all of these cases 
we focus on the human rights. The human rights. And I would like to read the, the part of the statement of Eleanor Roosevelt when she was the chairperson of a human, United Nations Human Rights Commission. You say, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet, they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works, such are the places where every man, woman, and child seek equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity, without discrimination. Unless this right have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concern, citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in larger war. Practically, and as then, all of this thought it could summarize in, in, in a saying that I read a couple times, a couple of days ago. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Then um, focus on this in, 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 in this case, <clears throat> in focusing in the human rights. We are considering that uh, the state has to get involved and resolve this. This is a, they are involved in a power relation. What, where in, in that relation, they are in disadvantage. Who could balance the, this situation? The state institution. They already said that uh, it started with the labor department, the court, sheriff, but any one of them uh, give us a, a complete solution. As the human rights uh, point of view is established, it is not just to say, hey, you won the case. It is not to say, hey, applause, hey, you won. Justice is more than that. Justice is not, a, is not just a resolution. Justice is an action. It's an action. It's a legal action. And who can do this? The only one that they could uh, do in this case is the state. But if the state is not doing what they have to do, then they are revictimizing those workers. Um, uh, then, as you can see, as you can see, the problem here also is that we are uh, demanding a state action. That's why we are supporting, and, and we are uh, talking with different levels of the state government, New York state government, uh, in order to uh, get a positive resolution, they say, um, to resolve uh, the court, declare, declare them as a winner of the case. The Labor Department declare that they, are the win they win the case. It is not enough. They have to do the following step. Absolutely, yeah. thank you. And then also, revisiting on the larger context of things, we came across this case uh, during the pandemic, and like during the pandemic time. So during, also during this time, it was also the excluder working campaign, and just advocacy to get necessary funds, survival funds, for those folks that may have not been eligible for um, unemployment and other government benefits. Can we speak a little bit more about the Excluder Workers Fund campaign and how all of this kind of ties up and um, how immigration also starts to play a role in this? 
Um, so uh, with, with regard to the excluded worker campaign, um, you all have sp spoken about it a little bit. Um, uh, maybe I'll mention both campaigns, the excluded worker campaign and then also the Dale campaign. Um, the excluded worker campaign began because uh, undocumented workers in particular and undocumented families were excluded from being able to receive the relief that every single other human being um, in the United States was able to uh, was able to receive when there was a, a global pandemic. Um, there was support that was designated um, for families uh, across the <coughs> United States, and people who were undocumented were explicitly written out of it, right, excluded from it. That was part one. Um, and so there were demands across the country to, for uh, some kind of local action and state funding for uh, excluded workers, and New York was a part of that. Um, and then on top of that, there was not just the exclusion from COVID relief, but then there was also the exclusion from unemployment insurance. So as you know, there was you know, mass uh, unemployment and, um, and undocumented workers, again, were excluded from being able to receive that. And, and uh, the excluded worker campaign was able to win um, in 2021 a $2.1 billion uh, fund to be able to um, provide some support to undocumented workers uh, who had been excluded. I always make sure to uh, emphasize that th that doesn't even begin to address the uh, imbalance in terms of the number, the amount of funds that are contributed every year by undocumented workers into New York State's economy. Um, it's partial payment um, for that, but it doesn't, um, it's certainly not enough. And the, the campaign continues. I will shout out Jobs with Justice, um, that there are a couple of our, our compañeros who are here um, uh, that, are, that are leading um, on the campaign now, uh, which is fighting for um, an unemployment bridge program, which uh, would create basically an alternative to um, unemployment insurance that undocumented workers, freelancers, people who are recently released from uh, jail, other people would ha who are excluded from unemployment insurance would have access to. So that's sort of, that's the current situation with that campaign. And I will also, I'll just mention very quickly, um, as Carla alluded to, that the, the, the other campaign, um, which is really what connects, connects us most closely with, uh, with this case in particular, um, is, the, is the Dale campaign, which is focused on deferred action um, for labor enforcement. And that's been a national campaign. Our organization, which is a national network, and the Workplace Project, which you know works on the ground, is, is a local member organization. Um, and that campaign, what we're doing is trying to lift up and visibilize the violations of workers' rights that are going on every single day in every part of the country, um, including here, clearly, um, by employers who are able to get away with it, um, right? Um, that they're able, the, the law exists. Undoc workers, regardless of their status, documented or undocumented, have the right to be paid minimum wage, have the right to overtime, have the right to safe and healthy conditions, have the right to be free from discrimination. And yet, work employers are violating those rights every single day. And one of, not the only, but one of the reasons why they're able to do that um, is because they're able to use immigration status against people, right? They're able to say, if you complain, you could be fired. If you complain, you could get deported. If you complain, right, they're able to use that threat against workers in order to maintain worker silence. And the, that, our campaign seeks to lift that up and to begin to change the, change the, uh, the dynamic so that workers should have an incentive to come forward. Workers who come forward like the next pizza workers are, are enforcing what we want as the United States, what we want to happen, right? Are enforcing our own labor laws, are bringing to light violations um, of the law, are working in collaboration with the government, right? That's, that's what they're doing. 
Um, and so our immigration system should be incentivizing that um, at, rather than being used against workers who are fighting for their rights. And so very recently, there were some announcements from the Department of Labor and from the Department of Homeland Security, which allow workers to uh, petition for deferred action if, the, if there is a labor agency complaint. Um, and that, to us, is an outgrowth of the fight of worker organizations on the ground who've been pushing um, and who've been you know, l supporting uh, workers and organizing for their rights. Thank you so much, Nadia. And to kind of shift this in into more of an immigration perspective, you mentioned deferred action. Um, there's a couple of things I want to bring up and tie up with that. Um, when, you're able, when, you want, when you need to get a job, right, you will need a social security number and you will need some form of uh, implement authorization ID. Um, I want to turn this to Jessica and say, can you walk us through how one may get these documents and also what is deferred action? Sure, so I'll answer the deferred action question uh, first. So deferred action is a promise, a temporary promise, that the government will not enforce or pursue removal or deportation against an individual. Um, deferred action can be valid for a month, a week, you know, years. It really just depends, um, and it's highly discretionary. And it can be revoked at, at any time um, for good cause. A good cause could be an arrest for something minor. Um, in terms of your second question as to who is eligible to receive this a work permit or, or a social security number, it helps to really back up for a moment. Um, isn't as, it isn't as if there are barriers. It's, there's one barrier to this, and that's the Immigration National Naturalization Act, the INA, the law that governs immigration. Um, and it is a very inherently xenophobic and racist set of laws. Um, and unfortunately, it governs who is able to work and who is not able to work in the United States. Um, and immigration law is not an inclusive law. It's inherently an exclusive law. And it really limits the individuals, again, who are allowed to work here because they have to have some sort of connection, whether temporarily or permanently in the United States. Um, and that really rules out most individuals. And that creates a disparity and a vulnerability that allows these employers to take advantage of workers because you need, to, you, you need shelter, you need food, you need clothes. You need to help your family who's back home. So you need to work. And it allows these individuals to, to, circumvent, you know, to circumvent the law. Um, so if someone who may be undocumented says, okay, you know what, I want to get my social security number, I want to get my employment authorization, how can they just apply for it? Or how it, work? <laughs> it would be wonderful if you just apply for a work permit. Yeah. If you could, there, were not, there would not be the 12 million undocumented individuals in the United States. Um, it has to be connected, as I said, to a program, whether a temporary program like temporary protected status, DACA, a deferred action program, um, or something more permanent, uh, you know, a green card, a U.S. citizen. Or it also applies to individuals who are in the process of pursuing some sort of relief, asylum, um, got a green card, because that takes a very long time to process. Um, but it's an incredibly limited number of individuals. Of the consultations that we do, I'd say about only 10 percent, and that's you know, individuals actually have <clears throat> some sort of form of relief. It doesn't matter how long you've lived in the United States. It doesn't matter that you're a tax-paying individual, a good individual. It doesn't matter. You have to fall within the certain parameters. All right. Thank you very much for that explanation. Um, and then just to start tying up, and before we open a Q&A section, um, is there anything that we as community members can do to support workers and to support laborers like the case of Nink's Pizza and what can we do as community members to help um, bridge the fit for this time? Well, how we can help. Uh, first of all, uh, organize a solidarity community. This is one way then we invite the uh, Hofstra University to create these committees to help workers and others because who, who are the excluded can be anyone. Excluded are a uh, meaning of marginalized. And who can be marginalized here? Anyone, all of us because race, 
because gender, because sex preference, because uh, economic condition, anyone can be marginalized. Anyone can be excluded. That's why I repeat, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And, uh, um, and also, uh, I would like to point out something. Everyone's talk about the undocumented and, other, and others uh, contribute to the economy. But um, how we could con uh, find out that they really contribute to the economy? When Nadia explained about the excluded funds, we found that the majority of those undocumented, they pay taxes. They declare taxes. They declare income taxes. 90% of those who the recipient pay taxes, but they are not uh, they are not recognized as a citizen, as a person who deserve protection and help. Maybe I, w I would just add um, two things for, for our students um, and people who are interested otherwise in, um, in supporting. Um, one would be to connect directly with an organization like the Workplace Project and to build partnerships. Like Miguel was saying, you know, whether it's through a student committee, a student organization, um, but you know, it's just helping to make calls to some of these employers um, can actually make a difference, um, can actually help some of the workers recover wages. Um, obviously, um, this situation with, uh, with the Nick's Pizza workers is, is extreme in terms of the amount um, and, the, and the amount of time. Um, but there's a, a lot that can be done um, by calling, you know, calling uh, employers and telling them that there is a community that is behind um, these workers, and it can be for you know recovering five hundred or a thousand dollars as well, right? Smaller amounts um, that can be really helpful. And then there is an action um, that the workers are planning. Um, and so uh, there was the <coughs> protest before, which uh, which Mario mentioned. Um, and I don't know if there's a new date um, for the coming action. I think we were talking about uh, the first week in April, most likely the first week in April. And so if, um, if there is a group also here that is, you know, that is willing to mobilize um, in support, that would be a perfect way um, to, to plug in. Sorry, let me talk to the mic. Uh, <laughs> um, if anybody wants to ask, if anyone wants to ask, how can we support the workers? 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 How can we support the es en Nueva York, debe ser eh, muchos casos en toda la gente que, que es maltratado por el, los patrones aquí. Eh, entonces, um, ¿cómo quisiéramos nosotros um, para que ayudáramos a esa gente? Tal vez con el caso de nosotros, que estamos yendo a mucho, eh, hemos tenido mucho... Y, eh, que nos están ayudando ellos, nos han estado ayudando mucha gente, hemos tenido y se ha visto el apoyo que ellos nos han dado entonces la otra gente que no quede fuera que, 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 que busquen ayuda que hay y que a veces, pero a veces es el miedo de, de las personas de que no buscan ayuda y Como nosotros, pues, ¿me entiende? No cerraron las puertas muchas organizaciones, eh, el Departamento de Labores, a Nassau Country. Y, bueno, fuimos a Carece eh, y en de ellos, y ellos nos están ayudando mucho. 
Um, so, it, yes, we're, we're looking for support for us, but then also for other workers, um, because we know it's not just about us, um, that there are many other workers that this, that this happens to, um, and that there are some workers who don't even, you know, don't even do anything or don't, don't file any complaint because they're afraid um, or because they try to, but then the doors are closed on them, like happened to us. Um, but we think it's important to to support all workers um, so that they can um, come forward uh, like de like we did. Okay. If there are no longer comments, then I'm going to open the space for question and answer. If anybody in the audience has any questions uh, for the panel for the panelists, um, this would be the time. Uh, and I guess while. I don't know if that's a question there, but I guess while we try to formulate some thoughts, this is also my invitation for you as students to get involved and that, because you can really make a change. But yes. Hi, so I actually have three separate questions, one for all each of us, but um, okay. I'm just gonna do it like this. So um, what was family life like working for more than 80 hours a week, including weekends? Oh, bueno, era una esclavitud en el trabajo porque no dedicamos tiempo para la familia. Um, it was like slavery at work because we didn't have any time to dedicate to our families. Thank you. Next question. Um, why do you think wage theft continues to be a huge problem by employers even in 2023? Um, why? Uh, as Saul said, they own, the, they already work. And it's uh, the waste theft, is, this is a gap between what the law determined that he should uh, earn during time of period, 12 hours, 12 hours uh, uh, worker, then but they just received, uh, i just making it up, the, they just received six. The other six, they earn, they work, but they are not receiving the, the, the payment uh, respect those hours. And it's just not one day, it's permanently, every day. Other ones, uh, I heard uh, one case, that the Saturday, they, work from Monday to Saturday, but they will, they are paid just from Monday to Friday. Every Saturday, they have to be there, but they are not paid that Saturday. And they work 10 to 12 hours. Every Saturday, they work there, they are there, they work, but they are not paid. And why also is this important? Someone told me also that um, why we are uh, demanding five hundred dollars. It was one case, and but he said probably for us, for you, for anyone of here, five hundred doesn't mean too much. But for them, it's a lot. It's meaning their food for the family. It's meaning to pay the rent. It's meaning many other things. That's why it's important with them. And our last final question, thank you. Um, do you think the government of Long Island, and even nationally, is working towards a brighter future for the immigrants and labor work? Um, I think maybe first nationally and, and then Long Island. I think one of the things that I had, I had uh, escaped me to mention before was that if you look at the um, at the Department of Labor, at the national level, um, the U.S. Department of Labor has about 800 investigators for health and safety in the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to cover every single workforce in the entire country. Um, that's it. And uh, the estimate is that it would take them, you know, 125, 130 years to investigate every workplace in the country. 
Um, so we don't have um, anywhere near the, the number of resources dedicated to enforcing our own labor laws that we would need to have if we really meant to enforce them. Um, similarly, the, U the Wage and Hour Division, which investigates wage theft um, at the national level, has right now about 1,500 investigators. And they're both trying to increase their budgets, but you know, Democrat and Republican administrations um, alike have not given the, the really the amount of um, resources that they need to. If you compare that with the amount of money that the United States puts into immigration and customs enforcement, border patrol, homeland security, um, and, and those investigations, um, I believe, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, it was, uh, it was 12 times more the number of investigators to go after basically people who are you know, working um, and contributing to this country. So um, the priorities of the United States are wrong. They're upside down, um, and they really need to be um, to be changed, to be shifted. And and until that happens, until we see um, the adequate amount of resources dedicated to going after employers, um, as is actually needed to make the law uh, to make the law work and to make the law real for workers, then we can't say that that there is um, there is really um, workers' rights enforcement. In, in this country, um, and in Nassau County, I mean, they 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 don't have anything, right? They don't have a they don't have a any kind of uh, wage theft protection law. They don't have any kind of workers' rights enforcement bureau. Um, there has been in previous times ad some administrative um, enforcement from, I believe, the attorney general um, or the DA, but. Other than that, there is very little, if any, protection of any workers um, at the county level in Nassau County. So the situation is bad at the federal level and worse here. Can I just add one other thing? Is is about it's essentially lead that leads to invisibility about the issue, which leads to the impunity of why this continues to happen again and again. So uh, if you just look at the what, what uh, Nadia just pointed out, the overwhelming uh, emphasis is on security. That's the narrative that comes out of the State Department. I mean, out of, out of out of Washington on a daily basis, out of all you know, left and right and center. That's the, that's the argument that's coming out. We have to build, you know, strengthen our borders, you know, strengthen our our border security, and so one has to think what that message sends to folks who are trying to understand the immigration, uh, the the, pro the many issues related to immigration, immigration rights immigration policy. If it's all about security, that clearly sends a message that you know, we have to protect ourselves against workers and folks who are here trying to live, you know, live a life, right? Not to mention the media coverage. There's dozens of studies that have been done over the years that the majority of the media coverage, national, local, regional, around immigration focuses on security issues. It does not focus on many of these other issues. Uh, and in fact, even in the study that we did, in the limited study that we did in a six month uh, uh, kind of news measurement of, of coverage here in Long Island, we had a list of about 12 different issues from housing to LGBTQ issues to crime to uh, cultural issues, immigration. And obviously we're in an area in Long Island where there's a lot of, you know, there's a good reason why immigration issues might be covered. Of all the news outlets that we, were, we, we did an audit of, I think it didn't even register in, in terms of stories that were covered around immigration and issues related to the immigrant community on Long Island. Uh, like it doesn't even exist. Uh, uh, again, vast majority of coverage focused on criminality, right? So th those are the kinds of things that makes the, the, these events, these issues invisible. Mm -hmm. I'm actually disappointed. I wish mm -hmm. there, was, there were more students here who were present for this because I think the more we hear about it, the more uh, that it could lead to some kind of action. I'm hoping that there, there, there will be here. Uh, through CCE and others to address not only, the, as Saul rightfully pointed out, not only about their case, but about the dozens and hundreds of cases we're not even hearing about. <coughs> uh, but also, uh, in this case, that's why uh, we say that we have to humanize all of this process. Uh, the state cannot uh, avoid the responsibility saying that we have a process, we have already uh, the law, and that's it. 
we have to humanize this in order to uh, become effective, in order to be efficient uh, with justice. Uh, humanize uh, that make possible that uh, balance, that unequal relation of power between victim and victimizer. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your question. Anybody else? Good morning. Buenos dias. Me llamo Joanna. My name is Joanna. Um, mi pregunta es para usted, Saúl, y los que están aquí hoy. Um, gracias por tener el tiempo para participar hoy en este evento que es muy importante para seguir la conversación. Um, mi pregunta es, desde que comenzó a platicar con estos tipos de organizaciones, ¿cómo ha cambiado su vida? Um, si también los otros quieren participar. Um, porque es, creo que me enseñó que son como siete de ustedes que están hablando sobre este caso. Entonces, ¿cómo personalmente su vida ha cambiado desde que comenzó esta conversación? Can you repeat your name? Yeah. Sorry, yes. Um, so I, my question is for the employer specifically, because there's seven that um, are being vocal about this um, issue. And so my question for them is, how has their life personally changed since starting this conversation with other organizations? Eh, bueno, la vida de mis compañeros y yo lo hemos visto que, que bueno, eh, hemos... Uh, que esto que hemos, gan hemos ganado porque lo, ya lo hemos ganado entonces eh, tenemos con ellos conversación a veces le, le decimos uh, lo que es justo es justo y, 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 y ha cambiado mucho porque hemos andado y conversando con ellos de que pensamos que nunca íbamos a, a recibir esto de lo que ya era ganado hace años y y ellos me dicen, sí, me dice lo que es justo es justo y no, fue en el 2009 que se hizo eso, en el 2011 fue la notificación y nosotros ahí lo hacíamos perdidos porque nosotros ya no teníamos ni comunicación con ellos porque, es, bueno, yo tengo casi 16 años ya de, de no, no, no trabajar ya con ellos este, y entonces ya con ellos hoy ya empezamos a comunicarlos todos, eh, se sienten bonitos como regresar de nuevo a, a la misma familia que tuvimos antes hace 16 años y bueno yo me siento contento con ellos haberlos encontrado y, y agradecido pues de que hemos participado um, so in terms of how um, how my life has changed well since we've started to to sort of have these conversations about what we have won, because we have won, uh, we were awarded these, these wages, um, we started to talk with the organization, and, uh, but also with each other, because we hadn't been in contact with each other as workers, we all went to work in different places, um, and so I feel like it's been um, very positive, very nice to be able to be back in, in communication with them because as I said, they were like my family. Um, and so now we're working together, we're talking about this, we're talking about what we can do together. Um, and, I, and, and I appreciate that. Gracias, thank you. Right. Thank you so much for your question. We have space for one more. Yeah, just one more. Uh, buenos dias. Um, mi pregunta es para el señor Asensio uh, y, y también darle las gracias por poner esto a uh, este panel. Um, señor, uh, lo que, mi pregunta es si usted tuviera la oportunidad de decirle um, a, su a su forma de trabajador, que era el señor de la pizzería, ¿qué le usted le diría después de 16 años de estar esperando este pago? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, well, thank you for putting the panel together. And uh, the, the question is for uh, Mr. Asensio. Um, if you have the opportunity after 16 years of be waiting for this, what you will say to the owner of the pizzeria at this point in time? Eh, bueno, como les dije anteriormente, no es que les estamos robando el dinero a él, no que es algo que nosotros eh, lo hemos ganado, es algo que él nos debe de hace tiempo, 
y fue por el tiempo de overtime que o todo lo que el departamento de labores acumuló. Um, I, as, as I said before, I would say that um, we're not stealing his money. Um, it's money that he owes us. Um, it's overtime, um, and it's time and wages that were accumulated. Y trabajamos con, con el corazón, no trabajamos por dinero, porque aguantamos 16 años, bueno, yo 16, lo, el menos que tenía era 10 años, de ahí la mayoría 12, 14, y fuimos fieles y, y, y trabajamos con él y, bueno, hicimos, le hicimos dinero porque ahora ya él tiene seis restaurantes. And, and that we worked with, with our hearts. Um, you know, we, we weren't working uh, for the money. Um, we, were, we were working with our hearts. We were dedicated to him and to each other. Um, and we helped him make money because now he has all of these additional restaurants. Entonces yo si lo tuviera enfrente le dijera qué pasa con el dinero de nosotros, eh, por qué, cuál es lo que tú no, por qué tú no lo quieres pagar, cuál es el, cuál es lo, lo que tú no nos quieres pagar lo que es nuestro. Eso es lo que yo le dijera enfrente a él. And so if I had him in front of me, what I would say is, why don't you want to pay us? Um, what is what is the situation? Um, what is happening with our money and why, why don't you want to pay this? Eso sería, bueno, mi respuesta para él, pues, si lo tuviera enfrente o, o, o el asistente, quien sea, Manny, bueno, ya nos lastimó con el maltrato que nos hizo. Ya tenemos, como dijo, la, la nueva vida nosotros. Yeah, that's what I would say to him and I, and I would say you've already, you've already hurt us Um, with the mistreatment that you that you had, um, so that's why I would ask them. Why, that's why I would ask him that question. Mm. Um, Could I ask the final yeah. question? We have about a minute, not even, but mm, I, yes. I suppose yeah. Go yeah, ahead, yes. Mark. Take uh, it. I'm wondering if there are any legislators or public officials on Long Island yeah. that are sympathetic to your cause, that students and faculty might be interested in contacting. Again. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, fortunately, uh, it is. There, there are some uh, officials uh, that are uh, supporting us. And one of them, um, like I said, officials and also institutions. Because uh, first, uh, as an institution, I would say the School of Communication, thanks to Mario and all of that campaign and the program, in between the relation, the communication, and the, and the organization. Mm -hmm. Through them, also, we, uh, the Channel 7, uh, when it's, uh, also was interested, Newsday uh, also was interested. And uh, <clears throat> then you see that our institutions and also uh, community organization, Job and Justice, uh, labor unions, as a 11.99, and, and others. As officials, public official, well, now is the assemblyman uh, Phil Ramos is uh, helping us in, 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 in this process. And this coming uh, Friday, we will have a meeting also through the, the good uh, intervention of Job with Justice uh, with the Attorney General Uh, New York, and we are uh, having all of this support. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a good segue. I just want to say a quick thing, um, and, and it's really directed to all of you, everybody here, and Carla and, and Jessica Funkaresen, and los trabajadores aquí, compañeros que están aquí con nosotros, Nadia, of course, as always, for decades, really, um, and Miguel. That uh, you know, I'm uh, again. I'm always, uh, I'm always optimistic. As as pessimistic as I am as a human being, I'm also optimistic that cada granito de arena puede hacer un cambio. Every little grain of sand makes a difference. Could make a difference. And so I'm, uh, you know, obviously this is one event. I know. So obviously we were hoping there would be more people, but you have. I want you guys to understand that there's a deep commitment from the the, the university from Center for Civic Engagement. I, I, I don't want to speak for um, our, our director um, uh, uh, back there who's been very supportive. 
Marty, other, other, you know, all the people from CCE committed to this work and to accompany you in all this. Um, the, the, the School of Communication, the, the Long Island Advocate, the radio station, et cetera, um, because we're part of this community, and so I, I just want you to understand that you, you'll, con you'll always have that accompaniment as long as we're here um, as an institution. I'm hoping that we could probably kind of lay the groundwork for some more, more work with the students at CCE who are doing incredible work in the community and uh, help with the organizing of mobilizations, uh, campaigns, et cetera, letter campaigns, et cetera, to try to make things happen. And you always have the space here. Los micrófonos siempre van a estar abiertos para ustedes. The microphones will always be open for you. Thank you very much. And with that, we can wrap it up. Thank you all to the panelists. Uh, for Hofstra University for hosting us, and thank you all thank for you. being here today. Thank you, Carla. <laughs>